Hello, and welcome to the Sensibly Speaking Podcast 2.0. This is Chris Shelton, the critical thinker at large. I had some really nice feedback from you guys last week on the new format and direction that the show is going, so thank you very much for all of your uh, positive remarks and well wishes and whatnot, and I hope you find this week's show just as interesting. We've got some pretty cool stuff coming up. Um, it's going to be about politics this week, but before everybody starts freaking out out there, <laughs> there is going to be nothing about Donald Trump, nothing about Hillary Clinton, nothing about the presidential race. I am not putting my foot in that pool ever again. Ugh, Ah, way too crazy. Too much nonsense going on on, on all sides with that. And I'm not going anywhere near it. I'm not talking about the um, Republican National Convention, the Democratic National, I'm not going near any of that. Instead, um, we have a little bit of a surprise for you this week. We have a we have a special guest. But first, I want to remind everybody out there that this podcast is available on iTunes, Stitcher, as well as on uh, video format here on YouTube, if you're watching this or listening to it on YouTube. And soon, we will also be available on Google Play for you Android listeners out there who aren't using Stitcher. Uh, Google Play has now been applied for, and I'm anticipating no problems with that. So we should be up on that format or venue soon also. Uh, So now let's get on with the show here. Now, um, we're just going to dive right into it. In the past, you've heard us, uh, you know, on this podcast when uh, Ruth and I were uh, discussing religion's intrusion into um, political, legal matters, schools, you know, government organizations, things like that. Uh, basically where we felt that, that it really didn't belong and where it seemed to violate separation of church and state. Um, now, what you don't hear a lot about in politics, uh, and there are a few reasons for that, is atheism. You don't really hear too much about atheists in politics. And uh, so I'd like to take a minute and talk about that. Um, in Some of you might not know all of this information, which is why I thought I would share some of it with you. You might find this interesting. In 1961, the United States Supreme Court ruled that states at a state level could not have a religious test for public office. Now, The Supreme Court was really only affirming what was already written in Article 6 of the United States Constitution, which specifically states that there no religious test, this is a quote, no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. Okay, now that goes all the way back to the beginning of the country. Kind of interesting. So here's the thing, though. If you look at atheists, now atheism, of course, is sort of, you know, one of the definitions for it or one of the ways that we talk about it is, is no religion. You know, there's no religious belief um, is, is one way that it's defined, right? Or not having any belief in a, in a god or gods is, is more specifically what it's supposed to mean. Um, yet, uh, there has been quite a bit of bias against atheists. Uh, here in the United States for quite some time. Uh, They cannot hold office. There are actually statutes and uh, laws on the books uh, in the following states where atheists are not supposed to be allowed to run for or hold public office or hold government positions of trust, such as a, 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 a county clerk or something like that, okay? These states are Arkansas, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Texas. So now, of course, since these bans specifically violate Article 6, which I read you, of the United States Constitution, and this has already been upheld by the Supreme Court, these bans don't really have a whole lot of teeth. But it's still interesting that in our country's past, the First Amendment has been interpreted to mean... uh, by some, that uh, freedom of religion doesn't mean you don't have the freedom to not have a religion. Hmm. 
Now, this is not a huge issue, and I'm not bringing this up as though that it is, because it's, it's, it's not. But it is an interesting one simply because of the poll data about the U.S. or in the U.S. about attitudes towards atheists. Um, plus, the lack of a very specific definition of atheism also makes it a kind of a complicated issue. Um, you know, it's been my experience, and I've said before, that if you talk to 10 different atheists, you're going to get 10 different ideas about what atheism is and what its definition is. And, uh, and I've actually done that. I mean, I've talked to a bunch of different atheists, and of course, um, I now, you know, self-identify as an atheist. And my, I, I know for a fact that my idea of my atheism is not the same as some other people I know who are atheists and what their idea is. Um, now, according to a June 1st, 2016, so this is very recent, a Pew Research Center article they published an article called 10 Facts About Atheists. And um, first off, there was a quote from the article. They said, estimating the number of atheists in the United States is complicated. Some adults who describe themselves as atheists also say they believe in God or a universal spirit. What? At the same time, some people who identify with a religion, for example, say they're Protestant, Catholic, or Jew, also say they do not believe in God. What? So this is like, what is this, right? So, you know, now personally, of course, I adopted the label of an atheist simply so I could self-identify as someone who does not believe in any version of organized religion or the God figure that's represented by any of them. And, um, I mean, we're talking Christianity, Islam, I mean, Hinduism, um, you know, Norse gods, Greek gods, I mean, any of those pantheons of, of, of guys, I'm not down with any of that. Yet, as an agnostic atheist, which is, I think, technically what I am, I will be the first to admit that I have absolutely no idea if there are um, is a higher being or beings that we would identify as a god or gods. Uh, I, I don't know. You know, and I, and I don't think anybody else does either, and I think it's kind of silly to even talk about it. Um, so that's, you know, how I identify, but others clearly identify other ways and yet call themselves atheists. Now, according to Pew Research, the number of self-identifying atheists has roughly doubled in the past several years. 3.1% of Americans say they are atheists, while another 4% identify as agnostics. And according to another poll I had seen um, months ago, uh, we're up to almost 20% who identify as non-religious, right? One out of five are identifying these days as non-religious. Now, your average atheist, though, pulling it back down to the, to the atheists here, per polling data, um, the average atheist is a 34-year-old, college-educated white male. They tend to be Democrats or liberals, with very few, only 1 in 10, identifying as politically conservative. And surprisingly, for those of you out there who think that atheists are a bunch of loudmouths, two-thirds of them say, per the research data, that they seldom or never discuss their views on religion with religious people. So... Uh, you know, if you've run into atheists, talked to atheists, had atheists try to convince you that you were wrong for your religious beliefs or whatever, you've only talked to a third of the ones who are actually out there. <laughs> we're everywhere. Now, despite their small numbers and the fact that atheists tend to keep their opinions to themselves, a 2014 Pew Research survey found that Americans rate atheists just one point higher than Muslims in terms of how harshly or warmly they feel about them. So I believe it was that um, Muslims got a, on a scale of 1 to 100 in terms of how would you, you know, feel, how warmly would you feel towards this group of people. Um, the uh, Muslims got uh, 40 and the atheists got 41. Right, whereas like Christians got like 63 or something, you know, they, they, they went up as you as you started getting into other groups. 
Um, and also, according to the same research data, 51% of Americans say they would be less likely to support an atheist running for president simply on this point alone, if they were an atheist. They'd be like, yeah. So just barely over half of the people in the United States are like, oh, you're an atheist? Yeah, no, you're not going to be president. No, that ain't happening. And you may or may not have heard that one of the things that had come up in the, you know, in the Hillary emails was that the DNC had been considering um, outing Bernie as an atheist or looking at that as a as something. And that's only re- only because it's directly related to this. Am I even bringing up anything about that presidential stuff? So interestingly, though, while 51% are saying, yeah, no way, no atheist going in the White House, 53% of Americans say that it's not necessary to believe in God to be moral compared to 45% that do. So con- country is interesting. It almost split down the middle on this point. So right now, no self-identifying or self-described atheists are serving in Congress, in the United States Congress right now, um, according to this article. This does bring me to our interview for this week. Um, now, this was with a man that we met, um, Ruth and I actually met, when we went to the Reason Rally in Washington, D.C. Uh, a couple months ago. His name is Wynn Legro, and he is a retired medical doctor. He lives in Southern Virginia, and he uh, not only ran for Congress for the House of Representatives in 2009, but he declared his atheism as part of his platform. He's, he, he, he'd been an atheist a um, very long time. We talk about that in the interview. We'll get to that. Um, but he, he decided that he needed to make this uh, something of pu- public knowledge because otherwise he thought it was going to come out anyway, and he didn't want that to come out you know, as a strike against him. So he declared that, yeah, I'm, I'm an atheist. And then he wanted to you know, move this campaign forward with that as, a, as part of his platform. He wrote a book on his life and on the race for Congress, and it's called Last Leper in the Colony. And this is a a picture of him holding up a newspaper article there. So I was actually, in interviewing him, I was much more interested in the political process than I was in the atheist atheist aspect of his story. Um, You know, it's very uh, rare that you get to talk to somebody who actually ran for Congress, right, whether they win or lost. Uh, that still, you know, you, gives you an insight into the political process that you're not going to get from a lot of other other people. So I was very, very interested in that aspect of it, and we talk about that in the interview as well. Um, so he was, uh, yeah, he's he's actually a lot of fun, and there's a lot that we discuss in in all of this. So let's go ahead and go to the interview. Here is Win. Win, thank you very much for being on here. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. So, got some questions here. So, first off, let's discuss your atheism first and how that occurred, you know, because different people come to atheism in different ways. Um, you have been a confirmed atheist since you were about 16, and you've, and from what you described, you've definitely been a very natural, critical thinker all your life. Um, and yet, your father was a minister. So, you know, how did the atheism happen, and were there conflicts? Well, there really weren't conflicts. I I wasn't one to try to stir things up, but I think some of us are just wired a little differently. And I can remember when I was, we, we lived in northern Vermont at that time, and I have one brother who's two and a half years older than I am, and we were out on a snowy hill away from any adult supervision and he said you know this santa claus stuff is all made up Um, any presents we get are from our parents or other friends or relatives and don't believe any of it i guess he thought i'd gone on long enough with the santa claus delusion (laughs) and bill maher has said how crushed he was when he learned about the Santa Claus charade, and my reaction was completely different. It was, well, good. That never did make any sense. 
<laughs> really? Yeah, and you know, I, I, I can remember back at that age trying to figure it out, and it just the logistics of one jolly fat man traveling around <laughs> the world delivering all these presents in one night was was just too much. And how did he get in the houses with no chimneys? So when my brother told me it didn't, it wasn't true. I thought, well, good, it doesn't make any sense. So I went home and told my mother that Big Brother Kent had clued me in, and my mother was something of a rational thinker, and I think she was sort of relieved she didn't have to keep up the charade anymore. And when a child can give up Santa Claus that easily at probably age six, the next thing you start to wonder about is God, because they said Santa Claus knows where we are all the time, knows if we're bad or good, gives toys to the good children, a lump of coal in the stockings to the bad children. And then I got to thinking, well, God supposedly knows what we're doing at all times, even knows about thought crimes, which is scary, mm -hmm. and re rewards the good with eternal life and punishes the bad by sending them to the other place. And it just seemed to me like God was Santa Claus for adults, and it didn't make any more sense than Santa Claus did. You know, very true. Very, yeah. very true. And so I can remember as young as age eight trying to convince myself that I did believe it, because I wanted to believe it. Everybody believed it in my world. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I would look for reasons to believe it. And once I heard the word atheist, and I asked my father, what's an atheist? And he said, oh, that's someone who doesn't believe in God. And that seemed to give it some legitimacy because there was a word for the thoughts that were starting to go through my head. And, you know, I, I would look for reasons and, and I went through a number that I would hang on to to convince myself I believed. And it's interesting that I can only remember the last one and the last one went something like, uh, if this, these stories about God and Jesus weren't true, it couldn't possibly have lasted for what was then almost 2,000 years. Mm. Oh, that's good. But then I got to thinking, well, the Muslim religion lasted many centuries. Judaism was older, obviously, than Christianity. And then there was the Hindu religion and Buddhism, and they'd all lasted for many centuries. And so one day when I was 16, I essentially said to myself, just admit it, you don't believe any of this. And it was, that was my one religious experience. It was like a weight was lifted from me. I didn't have to tell myself I believed it anymore. You had an epiphany. Yes, yes. <laughs> Excellent. Now, okay, now what, what um, uh, denomination, religion was your father a minister of? He was, well, <clears throat> my father was born in Newfoundland and my mother was born in Quebec. And both my brother and I were born in Quebec and we moved to Vermont when I was one year old. And so he was Church of Canada in Quebec and when he moved to Vermont, he became a congregational minister. And so he, he wasn't uh, an evangelical, he wasn't a fundamentalist, he accepted evolution. And so mm -hmm. it, it wasn't like I was uh, rebelling against that, it was just that it didn't make sense to me. Right. That's, that was fortunate, I would think, in a number of ways that he wasn't more fundamentalist, because that right. could have created some real friction. Um, now, speaking of, when did you guys actually move down into the Bible Belt? You know, for, yeah, first off, when did that happen? Well, I mean, I went to school in the north and, and started in Vermont, and I went to college and medical school at Ohio State. And then I, I well, first, after some of my training, I spent two years in the Army in Alabama. Mm. But a... An army post in Alabama is not like the South. It's like a cross-section of America because you're on the, the army post and you're not exposed to the rest of it. So I moved to Emporia, Virginia in 1979, and I've lived here ever since. Okay. Now, you said in the book that you 
did not really make an issue when you were a doctor there about your atheism. It was just sort of something you, you know, you felt. But I, I have a hard time believing that you, you actually survived all those years in the South and nobody knew. Like, what was that like for you? Well, yeah, I mean, people I was close to, they knew, and the word would leak out. And, you know, I would see patients and, and there were some patients I had seen for, for a long time and suddenly, and we seemed to have a very good relationship, and then they would just quit coming. Right. And so I knew somebody had whispered in their ear, that guy's an atheist. And so that was that, and, and, and that was all right. And I, I'm a, I did internal medicine and nephrology, kidney disease. So we have a dialysis unit here. And the most common causes of kidney failure in this area are diabetes and high blood pressure. And this area is roughly half black and half white. And the incidence of diabetes and high blood pressure is very high in the African-American community. So 90% of my dialysis patients were African-American. And, you know, they, <laughs> they assumed I believed. You know, I, I wasn't going to confront anybody. You know, at times I would, you know, I might have a sick patient in the hospital and I would be talking to the family and they would say something like, well, I guess we just have to leave it all up to God. And I'm not going to say, well, I don't believe that. I would say, well, that's all we can do. You know, it's, it's, yeah. not, it's not in my position to say, I don't believe what you believe. You know, I'm there to help them. I'm not there, certainly at that time, to challenge anything like that. All right. Well, that makes sense. I think militant atheism would not would not go well with being uh, with bedside manner and right, being, a, right. being a physician. Yeah, yeah. So that makes sense. Okay. And w what otherwise, you know, living there for as long as you have, what's it what's it been like being an atheist in the South? Well, <clears throat> my wife is a Lutheran. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, so I get used to, I mean, she knows my views and I know her views and we respect that. And I mean, she would get annoyed at politicians who would use religion trying to manipulate people to vote for them. That, that just rubbed her the wrong way. And so, I mean, we agreed on that. We agree on the separation of church and state. So on, on those general issues, we're certainly in agreement. And uh, I mean, it, it's religion is part of the language here. You know, you get blessed <laughs> frequently and you just, <laughs> right. like have a nice day. And, and there's no point in me saying, well, don't, don't do that because I'm offended because, you know, the, their intentions are good and but, but when, I, when I retired and decided to run for Congress, I wasn't going to do that. You know, you, you can either just say nothing and have people assume you're a good Christian because any white male doctor in Southside Virginia is assumed to be a Christian and a Republican. And I was neither. Right. And when I ran for office... I was going to be pretty clear about it. And, and the people that, that helped me in my campaign, I told them up front, look, I'm an atheist and I'm not going to uh, hide it. And if that's a problem, then, you know, just don't work for, don't work for me. Um, and well, in 2012, it was an off year. So there was no presidential race. There was no Senate race in the state of Virginia. So young people looking for a job they didn't care what I believed. <laughs> if I could pay them for a few months while they worked for me, for the most part, uh, they would do it. I had the woman who was my office manager, and I, I cover this in the book, but um, her, her, she'd been married three times, I think. She'd been divorced twice, and one husband had died, and but her, her first husband was a minister. And I said, well, you know, is it a problem with me being an atheist? And she said, well, no, uh, 
that husband ran off with one of the parishioners, and she'd been an agnostic ever since. So. <laughs> it, it wasn't well, there a problem. you go. <laughs> so okay, so now I, I guess I, I guess another question I have then is is since you've you know come out this way you know um, not necessarily just because of the the um, the race of the election but since that time have you noticed other or have you come across more covert or hidden atheists in the South? than you had previously suspected were there? Only if I go looking for them. Okay. Most, I mean, one, one person I know pretty well, he sort of said, well, yeah, I am too. I mean, I go to church some, but <laughs> I'm just right. sort of going. But, uh, you know, I've gone to meetings in, in uh, the Richmond area, the Hampton Roads area, the skeptic groups, uh, but in the rural south where I am, there haven't been a lot of people rushing up to me, you know, but a lot of, you know, people have known me for years and most of them aren't going to change their opinion of me because of that. Now, some, some do. I, I notice some people just sort of shy away from me, but that's their loss. Well, truly, truly it is. Um... Okay, well, let's go ahead and get into the politics now, because that's, that's certainly the main subject here. Um, now, you've been around and aware of politics most of your life, and I'm, I'm sure you have some pretty strong opinions on the subject. Um, first, though, how have you seen the parties change over your lifetime? You know, there's, a, there's an inclination on the part of a lot of people to look back to the good old days as better times than what we have now, and kind of curious what you think of that view and, and what you've seen over the decades from your own experience. Well, like I said, my parents came from Canada. So, you know, in a lot of families you grow up, they've got the family religion and the family politics. Well, my parents didn't really. They came to this country and they always made sure that we kept up with, with current events, with what was going on. And before we had television, we would sit around every evening and listen, listen to the news on the radio. So I was aware of what was going on. Um, but, I mean, there used to be liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats, and the lines weren't as strictly drawn as they were today. Now, you know, I grew up in the North, and this, this is very much the South here. Uh, when I was growing up, I wasn't aware that segregation lasted as long as it did. Mm. Um, you mean that, past the point where it was yeah. illegal? Brown versus Board of Education was 1954. Mm -hmm. I graduated from high school in Ohio in 1963. I came down here and met a guy about my, uh, I think he graduated the same year I did. He graduated from a segregated school in Southern Virginia in 1963. They dragged their feet. You know, they had the massive resistance in Virginia where they closed schools completely for like four or five years. Other schools dragged their feet as long as they could to uh, keep from integrating. My wife, who's younger than I am, remembers when she was in like the fourth grade when they started to integrate. And she's, she's 10 years younger than I am. And so I just wasn't aware that it dragged on that long. I mean, the local schools, we live about two miles from the public high school. And in the north end of town is the junior high school. And I was informed when they were built, uh, the two buildings were built exactly the same, brick for brick. And no one was volunteering why. And then, I, you know, I found out one was the white high school, one was the black high school, separate but equal. Right. And so they hung on to that as long as they could down here. And there's still some lingering <laughs> stuff going on. And, and so, you know, how things have changed over the years, certainly uh, as far as the African-American community is concerned, uh, we've, got a, we've got an African-American president. Uh, so that has changed. But when I look at this present election, a lot hasn't changed. There's still a lot of 
racism out there, and it's quite obvious in this present election. So, have you noticed any sort of um, is uh, like is your state uh, mainly pro Republican or Democrat? Well, it is sort of in a state of flux. Virginia, Northern Virginia, the people who live and work in D.C., a lot of them live in Northern Virginia or in Maryland. So Northern Virginia is quite Democratic, quite liberal. Rural Virginia is, well, <laughs> you know, we're half black, half white. And when I was campaigning, I could almost pick out the Republicans and the Democrats by the skin color. Now, wow. I did. I, I, you know, and of course, <laughs> there, there are some white Democrats down here, but you go, I go around to the Democratic meetings, and most, they were predominantly African American. Interesting. And, yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I mean, I met a, a few, <laughs> few African Americans who, after I met them, said, well, I'm a Republican. But I mean, at least half of them were pulling my leg, because I knew they weren't. <laughs> okay. And you are, uh, of course, you're a Democrat. Yes. I always, I always said I was, I was an independent, but I found that I almost always voted, voted for the Democrat. And when it came time for me to get, get in and, and run, uh, well, that, and, and plus Randy Forbes was the congressman here since 2001. And he, he was the one I ran against, and he was the founder and chairman of the Congressional Prayer Caucus. Which, you know, when I read that, I was boggled. I mean, talk about, just by its very title, now I know nothing about this uh, other than the title of this thing, but how do you have separation of church and state as a principle, and you have a congressional prayer? Like, what? The how does yeah, that, congressional how does that prayer even... Caucus. Well, they... they yeah, I had to do some reading about this. There are special interest groups. There's the Black Caucus, okay? Okay. Which is probably one of the most famous, but there's a caucus for kidney disease. And I was a nephrologist. I didn't know there was a kidney disease caucus. There's there a caucus is? For, yeah, wow. there's a caucus for minor league baseball. Okay. So, I mean, there, there are like a hundred of them. Most okay. of them you never, you never hear of. And there was never a prayer caucus until Randy Forbes saw fit to uh, to start it. Wow. Well, well, that seems a bit more of an infringement on on certain constitutional principles than the minor league baseball caucus. <laughs> well, it was clear that it was his one of his main purposes was to put religion in government as much as possible. Right. And you know, he he was the one. There was some bill going to go through, and he blocked it unless they made sure they put "In God We Trust" in the Capitol Visitor Center in large letters. And you know, they they make the point, well, that's the motto. Shouldn't it be up there? Well, when I was growing up, it wasn't the national motto. It was mm -hmm. "Pluribus Unum." And when I was growing up, when I learned the Pledge of Allegiance, it didn't have "Under God" in it. Right. Those were both put in in the 1950s. And so, like uh, like most non-believers, I've learned to say the the Pledge of Allegiance by inserting a deep breath for under God. Carry on through it that way. Right. Excellent. One nation, indivisible. <laughs> right. Move right yeah. along. Yeah. All right. So. Now, let's get into this congressional run, because I am, I am just all kinds of curious about this. So, first off, just tell me, what's it like to run for Congress? Well, before I ran and I was telling friends that I was, I was planning to do it, and they said, well, what do you think it'll be like? And I said, I think it's going to be fun. The first thing I learned was, it wasn't fun. Okay. It, you know... Well, I had run for a very short time in 2008, and they had a, a convention, and I didn't win, and so that was over. And then I realized I needed to get some professional advice. I really needed people who had been there before and knew how the system ran to advise me. So that's what I did in, in uh, 2010. 
sorry, but he said, okay, you're going to have to spend many hours every day making phone calls to raise money. Mm. And that was absolutely the worst part because, you know, I was a retired physician. I was financially comfortable. And I spend all day calling people who probably have less money than I do, asking them to give me money. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, that's some. <laughs> that's one of the few ways I can I can agree with Donald Trump, who says he's uncomfortable asking people for money because he's got billions, or he claims he does anyway. Well, at least he thinks he does, or says he does. He yeah, he, he thinks he does. Yeah. So it's a very uncomfortable process to go through and, and the guy advised me he said well you'll you know you'll get used to it it'll become second nature well I got used to what I would say on the phone but I never got comfortable with calling people asking them for money the other thing was I had to go around to all the local democratic groups mainly and speak to them and I had spent I was in practice medical practice here for 29 years and I didn't speak to groups. I spoke to patients and their families. Right. And when I started to get up and talk in front of groups, uh, you know, I would get tongue-tied and my knees would shake, and, and it, it, it was a real adjustment. Now, it, it got better as it went on, but that wasn't something I was a natural at. So the talking, so I'd spend all day calling people, trying to raise money, which I hated, and then go out in the evening talking to groups, which intimidated me. So... It was not fun. <laughs> okay, I can see how that could be. What, yeah. um, what would you say that was the most surprising aspect of? I mean, looking back at the race now, what what surprised you the most about the process? Well, I mean, and again, I'm a Democrat. I'm going to vote for Hillary. But when Hillary says, I took all this money from people, and that's not going to affect at all the way I govern or look out for things, that's, not ju that's just not human nature. When right. people give you money, they expect something. And, I, you know, you really feel that once you start doing it. People are giving you their hard-earned money, and they expect you to act and vote in, in a certain way. And if you think they're not, you're kidding yourself. Um, yeah, so. I mean, even as a politician, even if you think, well, I won't let this influence me, you make a good point. Because, of course, they expect it to influence you. Right. Yeah, I remember seeing some guy testifying in front of Congress, and he'd given a lot of money to various politicians, and they were trying to grill him there, and they said, did you think that giving money to this particular politician would affect the way he voted? And the guy said, well, I certainly hope so. <laughs> right. That's why I gave it to him. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. What, um, that's interesting. So now, in terms of how the election process goes and in how, you know, and how the government is run in that regard, what, um, what were you exposed to that you, that, you, that you found was the least, you know, was the most unexpected part of that that you didn't really see coming? Well, I went into it thinking that I really have to have a great grasp on all of the topics that, you know, might be brought up. Mm -hmm. And then you realize that people are, a lot of them are just listening to a very limited number of things. You give the right answer to those things and that's all they want to hear. Or you can, you know, you can be like Donald Trump and say nothing at all. And, and a certain segment of the population thinks that's wonderful because of who you're criticizing. Uh, so the talking points kind of took you by surprise. Yeah, yeah. And, and well, I, you know, I, I went into this thinking I'm going to lose unless I do something to stand out from other other Democrats challenging Republicans because, in it, you know, we didn't know it was going to be such a bloodbath for Democrats as it was in 2010. But every incumbent Republican in the country won, with the exception of one, which was a very weird case in Louisiana. And many Democrats got beat. 
So it was a very tough, tough year to, to jump in and, and start running. And so I knew that from the beginning. And so I thought, well, I've got to do something that's going to distinguish me from the rest of the field. And I thought, well, I'm going to be public about my atheism. At least that will get me some attention. And if I can get national attention, maybe I can get in enough, bring in enough money to have television ads. And if I can get television ads on, maybe it'll take off from there. Because the way it was set up, there were supposed to be three joint appearances between me and Randy Ford, where we would appear at the same event, both of us at the same time. And I showed up to the first one and he wasn't there. And I showed up at the second one and he wasn't there. And when I showed up at the third one, I didn't expect him to be there. But there was one scheduled debate. It was gonna be on television, on public broadcasting, and I thought, well, at least I'll have this one debate. Now, the idea, you know, I was intimidated by speaking in front of, front of public and debating somebody on television, you know, scared me to death. But I thought at least I'll have a shot at it. Maybe I'll conquer my stage fright by then. He wouldn't debate. He came up with excuse after excuse after excuse because he knew if he just ran the clock out, most people didn't know who I was. I couldn't afford uh, to put ads on television. And I uh, even close to the end, end of the election, people would say, I didn't know you're running. I haven't seen any lawn signs. It's amazing how important people think lawn signs are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you may not know anything, but if you've got a lot of lawn signs, that gives you legitimacy. That's, you know, it, I guess I shouldn't be surprised that it's that shallow. Yeah. You know, but then again, there is a, something to be said about marketing and promotion and repetition of name and name recognition and those sorts of things that is part of the political process, you know, because you are doing a sales job when you're running. You're right. selling and yourself, so, you know. I want, I want to say the main reason I ran, the number one reason was my concern over global climate change. Mm -hmm. Because I am absolutely convinced that it's real, that's caused by human beings burning fossil fuels, and if we don't do something, the repercussions down the line for our children and grandchildren are going to be incredible. And I wanted to get into a debate and make that point. Uh, couldn't get him there. I'm, I'm actually, in hindsight, based on what, see what you're saying right now, I'm not at all surprised. His strategy was sound, you know. Right. He why give you the free platform to become known and become a better opponent to him when instead, if he could ignore you, you know, he, he had the name recognition. And his main goal was to get reelected. And it, that's right. Well, I, I start before I even told anybody that I was thinking of running. This was back when George W. Bush was president. And he was one of my motivations for running because I thought, if that guy can be president, I can be a congressman. <laughs> I'm sure you're not the only one who said that. <laughs> but uh, back during that time, Congressman Forbes would write articles and put them in the local newspaper. And if he put particularly good ones in there, I would, I would cut them out and hang on to them. And one of them was the importance of individuals running for office uh, debating other people. He said they, they have a responsibility to debate their opponent. And he went on and on about uh, Lincoln-Douglas debates and said, uh, you know, instead of just the 10-second soundbite on television, people deserve to hear the candidates discussing the topics of the time. And he went on and on about how important that was and then when the time came, he wouldn't do it. No. And so I wanted to, I, you know, whenever I was interviewed, I would try to bring that up and say, look, he said it's important to debate, and now he's refusing to debate. Mm -hmm. And we, kept, we did get a number of stories in the paper about his refusal to debate, but it wasn't enough to move him.
Right, just spurring him to do so. Yeah. What, what you mentioned a little bit about, you know, the fact that you had, um, you'd come out as an atheist, you made it very much uh, a, a part of your platform. Um, maybe it was a little surprising to me that it didn't gain more attention. But what role did that end up playing, looking back, you know, in on that now, in your, you know, in your campaign? As far as the results, probably not much at all. On, on the day of the election, I went up to Petersburg, and uh, one of the polling places was very busy. People were coming and going. And uh, this attractive young African-American woman came up to me and said, somebody told me you're an atheist. And I said, well, that's right. And she said, well, I already voted for you. <laughs> and I said, well, thank you. <laughs> So, I mean, as much as I tried the day of the election, most people probably still didn't know. Most people don't read the paper. I mean, there was, there was one big news article that the Virginian pilot is out of Norfolk, and it's the biggest newspaper in the state of Virginia. And you showed my book cover, but what I'm, what I'm doing here is holding up a newspaper. Mm -hmm. And that is the Virginian pilot, and the headline at the top says, In God Only One Trusts. And it's talking about the race between me and Randy Forbes. And so that was the, the most publicity that I got. And uh, even after that, I, I, <laughs> I spoke at a large gathering of the NAACP about a month after this came out. And I thought, you know, I really have never talked in public about my being an atheist. And so I'm just going to mention it in my talk. And I thought, you know, it's been out for a month. I don't think anybody in the room knew. Wow. Uh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm curious, um, just, you know, again, just because I, I, I didn't know about this when, when I first started looking into this uh, in your campaign, but it seems there was not a lot of promotion or marketing of your names and, and your name and positions. I'm curious, was that a financial thing? Is it just a, just straight up, we didn't have the money to do it? Or what was the consideration on that? From my point was, yeah, yeah. You just, you got to have a lot of money for that. And I, you know, the best way to run for office is probably run for office and lose. And you find out everything you did wrong. You know, you find out you're paying people to do things that, either they're not doing or, or you could do without them and you know where you you should be putting money and where you, you know I probably would have had one less person on on the on the roll and put some of that money into a few television ads or something mm -hmm. but uh, you know you, you have to go through it to really know how the process works and, and you also asked about uh, how the election turned out in the state, Virginia has 11 congressional districts, and going into that election, six were held by Democrats, five were held by Republicans. And of the six Democrats, half of them lost. And of the five Republicans, initially they were all opposed by a Democratic challenger. One of the Democratic challengers was also a doctor, and he had declared bankruptcy, and that came out, and he dropped out. So there were at the time of the election, there were four Democrats challenging the Republicans. And I got the highest percentage of vote of any of the Democrats challenging a Republican. I got 37.5%, which was 74,000 votes. And that was a higher percentage than all the others. None of them admitted to being atheist. So was it that because it didn't make any difference or people didn't know. I was, you know, pretty much convinced at the end most people didn't know, despite the fact that it had been, it had been out there. I had been interviewed on television. They'd asked me about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, and there's also the, yeah, because, and maybe some people saw that, and maybe some didn't. There's also, you know, short-term memory loss. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. It and, goes and in one asked, or out the other, you know. Yeah, and you asked about what surprised me. One other thing was that I thought when something appeared in the paper that, you know, even if people didn't read it, if they were interested in what was going on, they would talk to people and word would get out. 
that didn't happen. You know, things would appear in the paper, nobody knew. It would appear on television, nobody knew. You know, people watch uh, The Apprentice on television and don't read the newspaper. Right. Yeah, very interesting. That's a, that, is a, that is surprising. I am surprised yeah. by that myself. Yeah. Okay, so American politics is a, is a pretty cynical game. And, and most, most Americans, it's, at least it's, especially with the presidential race, seem pretty jaded with the whole thing. What do you think, from your experience now, having been through all this, what do you think people understand the least about the political process that, you know, that, that maybe they should know? Well, it's clear that they, you know, this is a, this, this area, there was a big turnout when President Obama ran twice. And if you want President Obama to succeed, in the off-year elections, you need to get out and vote and get people into office who are going to support things that he has put forth. Mm -hmm. The drop-off, and it's not just Democrats, it's everyone. The drop-off in off-year elections is incredible. It's, you know, maybe 50 or 60 percent of the amount when there are presidential elections. It, it's like they don't understand how this process works, that, that you can't just put a president in office and wish him well and not put anybody in to support him. And particularly in off-year elections, if, if we had had the, the turnout of the, the number of people that voted for uh, the Democrat running against uh, Forbes two years previously during the presidential year, if I had got that number of votes, I would have won. And it was, it's not just this district, it's every district. It's, it's, people just don't show up. They show up for presidential elections. And some of them probably vote every four years, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's sort of an idea that we have a king. Yeah, and yeah. we call him the president. Said, yeah. You know? And, right. oh, he's going to take oh, care of all that. Throne and right, right. You know? And then, and they say, well, you know, Congress can't get anything done. Well, is, a lot of that is ignorance on the part of, of uh, the electorate because they don't know they have to get out and, and continue to vote on off-year elections and, and support the person they put in there. That's right. That's right. Because there, there were people who voted, I'm sure, who voted for Obama and, and voted for Randy Forbes. Who, who did his best to block everything Obama ever tried to put through. Right. And they don't realize <laughs> that that's not helping. <laughs> right. Huh. All right. Now, is there anything you learned in your experience um, that confirmed anything that most people believe, either you know about campaign funding or backroom deals or the role of lobbyists or, you know, because people have this sort of conspiratorial view of politics and it's all about the money and it's all, you know, money changes hands and that's how things get done and this sort of thing. Anything about that or anything else about the process that you learned actually was true, that, that people are right about that? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think what you, you just noted it is true. I mean, until Trump came up and... But I mean, Trump got all the free publicity, you know, whenever he would show up to say anything, they would cover it. Well, that was free campaign contributions for him just because they knew he would say something off the wall. And that, that's, that's not funny. usually the way it works. It's not usually people that everyone have heard of, you know, over the last 30 years anyway. But generally, uh, lobbyists stay in business in Washington because it works. You know, right. they they give money. They 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 uh, uh, essentially buy a buy a congressman or as many as they can, and and that gets done what they want to get done. I mean, it really does work that way for the most part. I think. Right. Did you did you get exposed to any of that system in in the process you were involved in? I didn't get get exposed to a whole lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> In the end, uh, half the money I spent uh, was my money. Right. Money and I spent myself. It, it seems to me it would be that way for a first run. Yep. 
you know, yeah. there's a, there's a, there's a, you know, you have to, you have to put out to get. And, right. Right. You know, and of course the Congress, you know, as a, you, know, you were running for, you weren't running for Senate, you were running for the House, right? Right. Right. So that's a two year deal. So right. I understand that, you know, you get in and then almost all of your time is spent on getting reelected. Yeah, I mean, you hear stories that people who are in Congress, that's what they do. You know, how, how do you spend your days? Calling people, asking for money. There was one Virginia congressman, oh, I can't remember his name, but he, he served, oh, I think 12 or more years in one of the Virginia congressional districts. He was a, he was a Democrat, and uh, he was retired when I was running, and, you know, I get these lists of people to call, and his name was on there, and I thought, well, I'll never get a hold of him, but I got him on the phone, and, you know, we had an interesting discussion, and, and uh, the one thing he brought up that he couldn't tolerate was calling people asking for money. And I said, <laughs> I said, well, it doesn't get easier once you're in Congress. He said it gets harder. He said it gets worse. He said he just hated it. And that's why he finally retired. Right. <laughs> well, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. It seems that it's the, it seems that, you know, when we, when we, the public, you know, the American public complain about, term limits and complain about people who make a career out of, you know, being a politician, that sort of thing. But they're mostly referring to senators more so than I think they're referring to House of Representative members. You know, when you're on this two-year clock, yeah, yeah. everything is, everything is very oh, urgent, yeah. you know, yeah. whereas when you're, when you're, when you got, when you get elected for six years, you know, you can rest a little bit. You can actually move on, maybe getting some things done. You know. Yeah, you can you can make some unpopular votes in those first two or three years, and just count on people forgetting by the time That's you're right. running it. But That's uh, right. yeah, it's like a perpetual campaign for the House of Representatives. Exactly, yeah. and it, that really twigged that really hit me when I went to D.C. Uh, you know, a month or two ago for the Reason Rally. Right. I hadn't remembered my civics lessons about the fact that, you know, the House of Representatives is a two-year term, the Senate's a six-year term, and I went, oh, like, yeah. suddenly everything got so clear. Right, you know, right, yeah. As to how the process must work for these guys. And, of course, you know, how seriously you're going to be taken by a senator or by, you know, the president or something when, you know, they know you're going to be out of there in two years, <laughs> right, unless you're yeah. really good. But of course, you know. once you once you get in and get a foothold, it's hard to move somebody out. I mean, the the uh, re-election rate is is well over ninety percent. If you're in and you're running, well over ninety percent get re-elected. Like Randy Forbes, he got elected in a special election because the previous back in two thousand one, because the previous uh, congressman had died in office, and so that was a fairly close race, his first one. But after that. Mainly, he just had to show up uh, wow. because his name was out there. People knew who he was. The person running against him was usually unknown, so he would ignore them. And, yeah, once you get your foot in the door, you can stay there a long time. Now, that <laughs> finally caught up with him because the 4th District got redistricted by a three-judge panel. And... Uh, when I was running, Petersburg was in the 4th District, and Petersburg is 80% African-American. And they took it out and gave it to Bobby Scott, the one African-American congressman in Virginia. But a three-judge panel reversed that, put Petersburg back in, put the city of Richmond back in. And so now the 4th District in the upcoming election is going to be 40-some percent African-American. And Randy Forbes figured he would lose. So he jumped over to the next district and where Scott Ridgell was a congressman and was retiring, the Republican congressman. So he tried to get the Republican nomination in the second district, which is Virginia Beach. And he got beat by a Republican in the primary. Got it. So he will be out as of January. All right. So nothing's I'm really gonna, totally certain. And I'm going to challenge into a debate again. <laughs> Good. Now that Good. you're not tied up with your busy schedule, let's try it again. <laughs> let's, let's do this. <laughs> yes, yes. 
and Excellent. see if it weasels out again. Exactly. Well, it seems as if they're if they're willing to do the work in the two years on the fundraising and you know keeping a campaign there that keeps their name alive, then as you said, you know it's not a, it's not a it's not a free ride. You know they do have to do that work. But uh, I just wish that that work didn't you know seem to uh, entail ninety percent of the of their total work. You know. Yeah, it, it's true. And then he, you know, he when I was running against him, he sent out this mailer, uh, you know, telling how we should go about balancing the budget. And it was just total baloney. But it was this big cardboard thing. And he sent out thousands and thousands of them. And in the smallest possible font, it's got printed and paid for at taxpayer expense. So that was like a campaign thing he could send out at camp at uh, taxpayers' expense that I couldn't do. Of so course. You've got, yeah, you've got uh, advantages once you get in. That's right. That makes sense. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, okay. Fair enough. So now, okay. So you've written, you know, your book, and it's you know very much an autobiography as well as the story about your foray into politics. Right. Um, so what's what's next for you? Are you are you planning on running again, or what do you what do you what's your what's your plan here? I, no, I'm not going to run again. I, I okay. mean, the district I'm in now is I mean, the two Democrats that ran this last time are both African American, since the Democratic Party is predominantly African American. And I'm sure uh, Donald McEachin, who I mentioned in the book, uh, I'm pretty sure he's going to win. So there will be two African-American uh, representatives in the next Congress from Virginia, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but that that is rot not really open to me. And I, you know, I'm not sure. Um, I've been trying to get the word out about the book. And thank you again for inviting me to, uh, to be interviewed. Uh, so yeah. that's part of what I'm trying to do is get the word out. And I mean, when I came out as an atheist, I, I thought, what would happen if some ideal presidential candidate came along somewhere down the line, and he or she, at a young age, had, had admitted to being an atheist? I thought this country needed to have this discussion, needed to talk about it, because there... Well, I ended up... I, I've got one chapter in the book where I talk about... Uh, meeting uh, Reverend Manley. Reverend Jake Manley was an African-American preacher over in Chesapeake. And in that article that was in that news, big newspaper article, he was quoted as saying he couldn't vote for somebody who didn't believe in a higher being. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how do I, how do I take this on? So I, you know, I wasn't, my father was a minister. I'm not intimidated by talking to ministers. So I called him and, uh, I said, you know, you're making judgments. You've never met me. And uh, uh, and so we talked a bit on the phone, and he warmed up a little. I said, how about if I come over to your office and talk to you? So he said, well, all right. And so I did. Uh, I took my Lutheran wife and my uh, African-American finance director from my campaign, and we went over and talked to him. And we talked for about an hour and a half and it was a very interesting discussion and, you know it, there were no fireworks and it was clear to me that he had never talked to an atheist who was openly atheist i'm sure he had talked to atheists but he hadn't known it mm. and you know his he said his viewpoint was that all good comes from god and he couldn't understand why i as an atheist was helping people and, you know, I, I told him wow. that 90% uh, of my dialysis patients were African-American. And so he realized I was helping out, uh, you know, his people. Yeah. And he, he just, it just didn't compute. And he, and he said, well, I think probably God is coming out through you because of your father's influence. And then he said, well, God is working through you because of your wife's influence. It couldn't be me just trying to live a decent life. No. And at one point in the conversation, uh, the devil came up. And I said, well, I don't believe in the devil either. And he said, oh, good. 
and it was like he thought that an atheist was a devil worshiper. I mean, it was like he had never had a discussion with with some a non-believer, and he just didn't. He couldn't understand where I was coming from. I mean, it was it was not malicious. It was just honest on his part. He couldn't see where I was coming from. You had to believe in God to do anything good, and and otherwise it didn't compute. That is so fascinating. That is so yeah, and that's, fascinating. That's why I was hoping to get this out and have a general discussion, bring it out, so that people will try to get a grasp. I mean, the number of non-believers in this country is going up and up, and still uh, there's this mental block that a lot of people have that they, if you tell someone uh, that a person's an atheist, they think they know, okay, they're a bad person. Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah. One in yeah. five or one in five are polling as nuns. Yeah. But that yeah. doesn't necessarily mean they're all, you know, self named uh, atheists. Because atheists no. atheists also poll as more hated than you know, than Islamic terrorists. I mean it's right. it's just right. it's right. bizarre. It's very yeah. bizarre. Yeah. So yeah, it kind of needs its own PR campaign. But it, you know, I don't know, it may be um, yeah, I mean, I would predict that that would be a very contentious affair had you gotten more traction on that in the media. I think you would have gotten lambasted a lot harder uh, over that issue, you know? I, I, yeah, I think you're right, but I, I, I couldn't understand why. I mean, I remember reading about the monkey trial, you know, Clarence Darrow, oh, well. William oh, yeah. Jennings Bryan, and that was just, that was covered nationally. It was even on the radio back in 1925, live. And I thought, well, Maybe I'll get some national interest. Nobody wanted to touch it. Uh, we got some interest from Keith Overman's uh, countdown. They heard about my discussion with Reverend Manley, and they wanted to get the two of us on. But Reverend Manley sort of got cold feet, and so that, that sort of died. But I got to thinking, and I put in uh, my reasoning in one of the chapters why it was. The Democrats didn't want to cozy up to me. Uh, Representative Lionel Spruill went on the radio and said, I'm not going to hell behind no Democrat. And he is a Democrat. So they were, Democrats were afraid that if they came out supporting me, the Republicans will say, you know, you elect the Democrats, you're going to have all these godless atheists running the government. That's right. So the Democrats didn't, didn't to go out of their way to back me. There were a couple that did. Um, um, Henry Marsh, who had was the first African American uh, mayor of Richmond, backed me, and Ella Ward, uh, who also ran for Congress two years after I did, uh, she also backed me. But most of them stayed a great distance away from me. Yeah. And then I thought, well, maybe you know Fox News will want to take me on. But their reasoning, I assume, was. If we attack this guy, it's going to give him publicity. Other non-believers are going to donate money. If we don't do anything, he's going to lose. Why are we going to stir this up? Right. Right. It was a matter of having enough of a, you know, kickstart, you mm -hmm. know, for your campaign that you would have been noticed anyway. Right. And right. then they would have had to give you the platform, and that would have generated more interest. Right. And more more funds probably for sure. And more controversy because they just they yeah. just love that yeah. stuff, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But I thought just simply putting it out there would be enough controversy that it would take off, but yeah. every group had a reason for staying away from it. Yeah. 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 I th I think that's true. I think that's true at a national level, and I think that's why we might poll the nuns might poll at one in five, but you know, one in five people aren't talking about it. Oh yeah, yeah, and I, I mean, I've talked with somebody up in the D.C. area who's uh, in one of the uh, skeptic group or humanist groups, and, and you know, they lobby Congress, and they, they're atheists in Congress, uh, but they don't want to come out, or they may be like Barney Frank and come out afterward. Right. And it was it was even interesting when I met when I would meet atheists, they would tell me, "Don't bring it up. Don't bring it up." I, I met with uh, Pat Schroeder. Uh, she was the congresswoman from Colorado for 24 years or something. And uh, she was initially Gary Hart's campaign manager when he was running for president. 
And then I think she ran after he dropped out and she didn't, she didn't last too long. But I met her on a cruise of the uh, Center for Inquiry. And I told her, you know, I was thinking running openly as an atheist. And she said, well, I wouldn't do that. She said, she said I would just say that uh, I'm a strong believer in the separation of church and state, and I want to keep my own views uh, private. And I thought, what fun is that? Because, I mean, I knew if I, knew if I do, did that, I would lose anyway. Right. And what I couldn't stand would be the idea of going through a whole campaign, as miserable as it was, and not having brought up the fact that I was an atheist, and at least giving it a shot. Right. Uh, so I, I did get it out. Well, that's well done of you, and I definitely validate your effort on that. And, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, give it a few more years, and, and maybe it'll start being a thing, you know? Maybe it will be. I, I hope right. so. So where can people get your book? It is, it is on Amazon. You can uh, buy the paperback on Amazon, or you can get it on Kindle. Okay, good. Is it is it self-published? Yes, it is. It, Excellent. It is. I, I, I'm a firm believer in self-publishing. I did it myself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I went to a I went to a writers conference this October of last year, and I, I'm convinced that most agents don't know what they're doing anyway. <laughs> and they said if if you had an agent and a publisher right at that minute it would be two years before the book would be put out. Yep. And I thought, well, I think I could do that, but I don't want to wait two years. I'm not getting any younger. This was, a, this was an election year. I wanted to get it out this year, and I said, you know, and I, I did have people go through and help me edit and so on, but, uh, yeah, it's self-published. Well, for self-published, this, this, is, this is good, you know. It's well typeset. It's very readable. You're a good writer. And um, and I definitely enjoyed you know I definitely enjoyed it, and I think everybody out there will as well. And if they're at all interested in the political process as it really happens, yes. then a boots on the ground kind of uh, observation here of what it's really like. Uh, this is a book. This is a good book to read. So check it out. Last leper in the colony on Amazon, and. Um, when, and let me also again. say that uh, let me also say that I do have a website. It's just winlagro.com, all one word, small letters, or last letter in the last leper in the colony .com. Excellent. Good. So Check it out, folks. Get to it that and uh, Win, thanks for being on. So, I hope you enjoyed that interview. Uh, I certainly did, and I learned a lot from him. And I also learned quite a bit reading his book. I do recommend uh, picking it up on Amazon. It's a, it's an interesting read. It's a good read. Uh, the parts that I that I've that I got to, I got I got pretty pretty deep into it. And um, and I I think he's a pretty interesting guy, and he's uh, and he is well. He is a good writer. So uh, you can check that out. I hope you enjoyed our podcast. I'm very eager and interested in your feedback. Uh, any comments, positive, negative, up, down, sideways. I've got some more interesting, very interesting people coming on the show in the next few weeks, um, which I'm scheduling out right now. So uh, stay tuned. Keep watching the show. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you guys next week.